My name is Paul Chinyakov, and I'm Kanye's delivery architect in Levi 9 IT Services. And yeah, I got used to sitting there in the audience in this room and uh, container solutions and implicit explicit uh, do a lot of meetups here, really lot. Of now it's my turn to stand here and to share some knowledge with you. And uh, not everything I will be talking about I have implemented. Some of this was implemented by my colleagues. Some of this was implemented by you, and I found out this in discussions with some of you. Uh, some of the things are theoretical, but I really think, well, it's valid. And this is what I'm going to talk about. So, yeah, these ideas come from uh, the different sources. Before I start, quickly about the company I work for. So, the company is called Levi9, uh, and our motto is One Common Goal. We are the company of more than 600 people, most located in Ukraine, Romania, and Serbia, with the head office in Amsterdam. And we develop software. Mostly focusing on the Dutch market and for uh, com uh, companies here in the Netherlands. And with the recent HIART survey uh, for outsourcing performance, we reached uh, well, unbelievable 100% of recommendations. So I'd like to start with this thing. And this is what a lot of people think software development is about. About DTAP Street. How we create and develop and test software. It starts with the developer laptop, well, things are hacking, working somehow. Then there might be even a development environment where people try to integrate things and it's barely working, but uh, sometimes it's working. And the moment it's working, people deploy it to test environment where some specially trained people ensure that uh, the software d doesn't have bugs. And the developers like to talk about, wow, there is a different mindset. You need a different mindset to test software. Some people were created to develop software, and some people were created to, talk, to test software. And a lot of people believe in that. I don't. I think this is, well, not, not bullshit, but this is not true. But this is what a lot of companies are doing, and I see, well, yeah, some people need, need to test software. But then, after some people uh, find the bugs, they return to developers, they hate each other uh, because, well, it was working, but something is broken, or it's not a bug, it's a feature, all of those things. After weeks, if not months, uh, uh, everything moves to acceptance, then some people uh, run it and say, finally, after hours, okay, we like it, and then it, it reaches production. And this whole line can take, well, weeks, months, if not years for a lot of companies. And you're always aggregating some chain changes here, then here, then here, until you're doing this big bang release to production. Or you can automate this. But then automation doesn't change the process itself. People automate it, but they still okay. We use development, then let's deploy code to development environment. Then let's deploy code to test environment, just automatically. But the rest of the process remains the same. We still have DTAP Street with manual testing, with all those things. I don't think th this is the, the best idea how we uh, should uh, develop software. I think this is a better one. On one side of it, the idea appears, and this idea how we will get a lot of money from those people on the internet. And on the other side, well, we finally have implemented th this idea, and the money flow is. Uh, come into our account and we all uh, drive Teslas. Uh, but actually any change you want to make it to production go through this, uh, or should go through this pipeline. It's not pipeline, the process. Starts with its inception. Okay, this is the idea and it needs to be validated at the end. I can't recall the statistics, but I, th I believe at least one third of the code of features that are created, if I'm not mistaken, well, with the percentage, they are never used by users. And this is a waste of resources, effort, money, everything. And uh, so these ideas sh should be validated at the end. But anyway, you create an idea, you plan it, you prioritize it, you develop it somehow, then you build it, then you test it, then you release it, and this is again when we reach operations. Uh, and what happens here, because we are constantly running through the same process and we're looking through it, the idea here is that uh, we need to create these shorter and shorter cycles to, to be able to release the software quicker, to release it in less time. And this is what 
yeah, for years already people are bragging about how many deployments a day do you do? Or what time does it take you between you commit the code to transcend production? And think speed, 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 let's churn those three things out. But the quality is more important than speed. You just can't churn out new uh, features and deliver them to production speed if you don't ensure the quality of those. <coughs> yes? Debatable. Okay. Let's talk about that. Perfect. Outside. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you need to, to ensure good quality, you need to check the application uh, because in that process there was no space for manual testing. Manual testing is one thing that you can't speed up. Well, you can speed up but just uh, stop doing some of the testing the, or uh, using a lot more people but neither of the th uh, things are really working. Um, so yeah, the, the, this will can to two ideas uh, how to approach the, the quality of the software. This idea is keep the product releasable. All the time the product should be releasable with every commit and build the quality into software development process. And I will talk uh, more or less whole presentation about these two ideas. Now, this is, well, if we abstract and uh, generalize uh, how the microservices architecture look like, uh, looks like. A number of services depicted is these hexagons that are communicating with each other directly through the event bus. They have some databases, maybe connections to uh, external services. And yeah, they work together as a whole system. Uh, but the biggest thing here is that each of these services, it needs to be independently releasable. I believe this is the core idea of microservices and why, why people start doing this. Independently releasable components of your application. This is what we, uh, we, we call microservices. And for that to be able independently releasable, you need to test them again separately. And with these, I believe that uh, people should transition with the idea how they used to test software uh, in the monolithic world, or regardless how we call it, to adapt to a new era of microservices. You can't just take your old practices, bring it to the microservices world and think oh, things will be working. It's just not true. So you need to reconsider these things. Quickly about some of the ideas of building the quality in. So, when people talk about testing, mostly it's about yeah, finding bugs, 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 what it is. And testing is not about this. Again, bugs is just one thing that is kind of a result of what you do with testing. But this is not the goal to find bugs in the software. Because if you haven't found, if you have found a bug, well, simple, software has defects. If you haven't found a bug, well, nothing is granted, it's maybe you just haven't found it. But then uh, you should think it from the other way, how you establish the quality, how you ensure the quality of the software, not how you ensure that it's, uh, it has bugs. And this perspective changes uh, really what you do with testing. <coughs> that should not raise the, uh, raise the cost of maintenance, because one of the ideas that people are doing, okay, these are our test cases, uh, hundreds or thousand test cases, we created them, well, it takes uh, days to go through all the test cases, let's automate them. Superb, we automated all the test cases, now they're running five hours instead of several days of manually. Uh, but any change in the software breaks those tests and they're running for five hours. And you need a special team dedicated that will support this uh, test suite. And this only increases the cost of maintenance, but it doesn't change actually how you are uh, running the, the testing. Because in addition to source code, you now, you now need to, to, to maintain the test, but does it provide value to you? Not in every case. But it's a bit awkward to say that uh, the test breaks if you uh, build a new uh, software. And if you don't you update uh, the automated test, it will mm -hmm. break. Or might not, but in most situations that I see, uh, it's, bro it's broken. And in a lot of situations I see where uh, people automated whole, all the test cases, half of them are sometimes working, sometimes not, and then people just either disable them, or just uh, stop using them, or the response is, oh, the, the build was broken because the test uh, failed, uh, just restart it again. This, well, people are spending time, companies are spending money to implement this, but it doesn't provide any value in, in return. It shouldn't be like that. But if you don't change the API of a microservice, for example, why should a test break? Uh, this is a bad question, then the, the test probably won't break. But uh, I'm also talking here, 
Uh, from this perspective about functional testing, because the, the, this is where people will start into automating testing. And then API might not change, but if the tests are also implemented incorrectly. And again, the pattern here, uh, the companies that go along this route, okay, there were a team of manual testers, now you are developers, automate them. And they have no clue how to create code, so they create uh, code that any tiny change in the application breaks the test. Like, for example, if they look for a button, they either have a name of the button or location of it, not uh, how you, you find it with the object ID, for example. Just one example. So the, the, this why, in, yeah, you need some professionalism how you, you start doing this. I will talk in more details about this. Uh, again, it's not only functional, like you, you mentioned API, uh, API change, we might have API contracts, and we, we uh, will talk about uh, other types of tests. Uh, but the more important part that the quality should be established early in the development process. So before you start developing software, you need to find out how you will ensure its quality, not afterwards. And not developing for some time and at the end of the sprint testers will so, uh, do something. You, you need to, immediately everyone should know how we're going to do it. And this needs to be clear for everyone in the team. Because this is a shared responsibility. It's no longer okay, testers test, developers uh, code. There is a multifunctional team and team is responsible fully for the application, including its testing. And it should be part of the definition of that. Again, you, you, you can't implement the feature and then in the next sprint change your tests. Again, your tests will be broken and they won't provide the feedback you want. Move the test to, to the left is the idea that you need to start testing as early as possible. To provide feedback to developers as early as possible. Again, uh, you can't do it at the end of iteration. You need to do it uh, with every commit and as soon as possible. It's a big debate whether people should use test-driven development or not. I believe everyone should be using it because it changes the mindset how you think about the testing and development software. You first create requirements in a technical language and then you implement the code that fits into the, these requirements. So it's, again, it changes perspective. But I've seen a lot of attempts doing this with, uh, well, and it failed because people either didn't buy in or people were not dedicated enough to, uh, to do it. Or people were slow, uh, first one, two sprints before they got used to working in TDT and the management decided, oh, oh, oh uh, suddenly their velocity was 40 and now velocity is 12, we need to stop this exper experiment. So again, it's debatable. I would advise, yeah, to go for it uh, if you can, because uh, the, this is what I believe directly. But if I think from the process perspective, I'm talking about build test release cycle, because this is what actually every team member will see each day, how um, the software is working. And this is, yeah, here. It immediately is, seems here. If we think about pipelines, this pipeline looks like this. On one side of the pipeline, we throw in the source code. Then we go through build, test, release stages. And on the other side of the pipeline, we get a magically working software. Uh, quality software. And uh, this is, uh, and this needs to be a reproducible and repeatable process. Because you will do it probably a lot of times a day, or a lot of different people are doing it, but the process needs to be the same all the time. And um, I also think that this changes a bit perspective from uh, on every commit can use deliver says that you need to create potentially releasable product to keeping the, really the product releasable. You, you can make a decision not to release it, to, to deploy it to production, but it, you will be able to do it if you want. And, and not potentially, it is ready. This is what we're achieving with this pipeline. What happens here, well, at the build stage, we do everything that makes sense to do with the source code until we compile, create an artifact and version it, and assign a unique version. And if any of these uh, stages fail, we just stop the process. It makes no sense to continue if, uh, if something has failed here. Just why would we even create artifact if uh, Lint uh, said that we've got uh, problems with our syntax? It's just a waste of resources. But then the tests, and this is what uh, we're uh, working with the produce binary, artifact. We're running all sorts of tests and we're running them in parallel. We'll talk about that. And then we release. This is how we make our software available. But the key idea here is really about testing, how we run those tests. And we should run them all together in parallel. Because uh, the, the, this is what creates the idea of um, just all, you specify all the criteria you need to establish quality of your software. 
Because if all of these tests have passed, you can stamp your bill quality assured. Here you are, gentlemen, new version of our software. And the thing here is that uh, why DTAP is not needed? Because uh, you provision infrastructure immediately before you want to run your tests, specifically for this kind of tests. Be it Docker, be it uh, um, AWS Army, whatever, regardless how you do it. You provision it right in time before you run the test. And for each specific test, you provision a separate environment. And, and you can run them in parallel, really, dear, well, two uh, flows or 15 flows, it doesn't matter. The process is identical. And if you create a proper testing framework, testing framework can even create these environments for you. If not, well, you can script it all, all, always. But this is, go. this is how mutable infrastructure works. It works. You create it, you run the test, and then you dispose of infrastructure. And you do it all the time, all over again. There is an interesting idea here. In order to limit the amount of time the tests run, because again, I was talking about end-to-end -end tests that takes hours, uh, there is an idea of environment time to leave. You can specify, okay, let's create environment, but it, uh, time to leave is 40 minutes. So you are forced to split your test into uh, parallel chunks just to keep the feedback loop to development short. Otherwise, again, you, the test might run for five hours and then developer is already drinking beer this evening and uh, he, he comes in the morning, oh, it's broken, oh, Peter, I can't recall what I was doing then. So it can happen. Um, yeah, again, in the world 2016, we're talking about Docker, we're talking about all this information, programmable infrastructure, infrastructure as code, if you're still using DTAP, if you're still using static environments, if you're deployed to existing environments, you're doing it wrong. You should recreate it, you should use immutable infrastructure. Now, you've seen the testing pyramid. Probably no. Uh, well, <laughs> I believe pe pe people who really well, who work a lot in software development, they see it. And well, we can talk about the pattern of cone, but it's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about all the, these sorts of tests, uh, how they're connected, how they're working in microservices. But two things here, okay, the testing pyramid shows how many tests of each kind do we need to have. The amount of unit tests should be the most amount, the integration tests a bit less, contracts end to end, and here on the top, close to no manual observatory test. Additional uh, perspective is execution time. When we move from the bottom to the top of pyramid, uh, execution time uh, increases. At the bottom, we are talking about milliseconds, this execution time of unit test. Integration test, milliseconds to seconds. Contract test, uh, well, seconds to minutes, minutes probably. And to end test, uh, minutes to hours. And manual test, days, weeks. Um, but there is another perspective here. Uh, the feedback. When we move from bottom to, to the top, we're providing more and more feedback to business. Because if unit test has failed uh, for product owner or for product manager, it is what? Okay, it failed, so what? But if end to end test, well, he says this feature is not working. But for the development, it's completely the other way around. If end to end test fails, well, good luck finding uh, how to fix it. You may spend hours and then fix it in minutes. But if unit test has failed, you know immediately where the problem is and uh, you, are, you, you can go and, uh, and fix it. And this is also what people call a difference between building uh, the right thing, uh, what we're building, to building the thing right. <laughs> uh, how exactly we're doing. This is also a difference between technology facing tests and uh, business facing tests. And uh, yeah, this is the perspective on the pyramid. Now, if we get, get back to our microservices, so let's take one microservice and see how this stage is applied. Uh, this would be the microservice, yes, you, if you understand it. Uh, unit test. We're testing each of the units in separation, be it uh, object, be it methods. We want to test it in isolation, how it's working. Just take only one, focus on it how we can prove that it's working correctly, or how the, we can prove that it's working incorrectly. And we're focusing just on one tiny part here. And, okay, people talk about coverage. Should we have 100% of coverage of unit tests or not? This is not the right question, I believe, because you can reach easily 100% coverage, but uh, do your unit tests uh, provide the correct feedback? Uh, probably not, because again, you can create them quickly. Uh, in Java world, I know there are already tests for your unit tests. 
uh, that can mutate the data on the fly with the idea that uh, if you, you run it, your test must fail, and if your test doesn't fail, you have created incorrect test in the first place. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's hard to, to give ex exact advice, but you unit testing are the fundamental part of uh, the software testing or, or in the feedback for, for the web development. And it's easy to, to, to make them incorrect, but especially for microservices, they are really, 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 uh, really important. And again, as I mentioned, if the test is broken, they show exactly what has failed. And uh, additionally here, if um, we will talk about feature toggling. Uh, we need to test it as well because feature toggling is one of the mechanisms to how you separate deployment from a release. So this is where you start testing your feature toggling with your feature and without your feature. This is where you start. If we move to integration testing, we will test uh, several units together, how they cooperate, how the objects work to, together. We want to ensure that they are working correctly. And again, here we, we might talk about feature toggling, um, how we, we do it, uh, but then there are flows in your code that you can say, with uh, we should beha have behavior like this, without we should behave like that. But integration testing is the next level, and again, it's uh, the two most uh, fundamental tests for the developer that, that provide feedback how their software works. Then we move to context testing. We take whole service as a whole. We forget what is inside. Uh, this is why some people call it black box testing. We just um, think of this, okay, how we can uh, not knowing what's inside the application ensure that it's behaving correctly. Because uh, this is how uh, services uh, talk to each other through these contracts. And we need to ensure that these interfaces are still working and these interfaces are still valid. And you might want to check different integrations on the picture I've showed you. So, okay, so some of the services are uh, communicating directly to each other, some of them are communicating through the message bus. You need to ensure that all these communication patterns are still valid for all of those services. Um, yeah, in some cases, you might want to uh, check several services together and create a flow, but this is where end to end tests actually belong to. This is where uh, we're talking about how several services communicate together. And whenever we're creating them, we're talking about, okay, let's create, we'll describe those, uh, not test cases, how we used in the manual testing, but the flows. We can create personas for people, or create user journeys, describing, okay, what will happen? Uh, how users are to interact with, with your system? And describe the, the, this flow coded, and then test if it's still valid or not. And, uh, because it can be described in this business language, a lot of people end up uh, creating this test in a behavior-driven development style, in a specific uh, domain uh, language, in DSL, domain-specific language, or language of business. And I've seen even implementations when all these end-to-end -end tests are created by product management. Developers have created a dictionary for that, and uh, product manager creates a code given something when something then, given when then pattern, and Tests are created automatically because uh, everything is coded by, by users. BDD is a huge topic, I won't uh, de describe any details, but th this is just one of the idea how to do it and testing, how to do it correctly. Uh, a lot of people fail with end to end testing because sometimes, well, it's hard to create user journey without specific data. And if you don't think of the, this up, up front, you might end with a test that requires some data up front. And then if you start parallelize or uh, run it in several, in a different sequence, you just have no data and your test starts failing. So data independence is an important thing here. Um, yeah. So, as I mentioned, all communication of microservices happens through these interfaces, the contracts. And this is why we must test them, but also the problem is how we transition between them. <laughs> and this is an interesting story, we need to version them. Okay, there is a uh, debate happening how should we version API contracts, semantic version, not semantic version, all of those things. Well, first of all, I believe semantic version doesn't apply to contracts, so because, well, what is the patch of the contract? It makes no sense. We have a major and minor version. 
but this is also a question of whether we should uh, uh, version only uh, external, the public uh, contracts, the public APIs we expose or only internal. I believe all of them uh, must be version and especially the internal ones because this is how your application behaves. Because you, uh, you can't just uh, throw in new version of uh, the, the contract and disable all of them because these are the services that, that, that are working with it. So you, you create a new version of your contract and you're running both versions together. And you're waiting for these services to transition to, to this new version of contract. Because otherwise, and uh, th this has been a pattern in monolithic application, you must change all the parts together. And it can work in monolithic application, you've got one code base, perfect. Here, these are separate teams working on these services. Uh, these people might not even know each other. They might uh, live in completely di different time zones. You have no clue. So even if uh, the, the, these are the, the services created by your, your, your fellow teams, team members you need to, to create the process, create and run them together. Then uh, announce and services will start transitioning to a new version of the contract. And only when all of them are using the version of the contract, only then you stop using the old one. And uh, this is a manual process, but this is the process that keeps your product releasable, keeps your product working all the time. Because otherwise, you are immediately breaking things and yes, some parts of your application stop working just because you implemented some change. Okay, uh, and this also supports uh, the idea of independent releasable microservices because yeah, this change and this uh, change are completely separated in time. Now quickly to talk about uh, this part of uh, testing pyramid. Okay. So, and uh, okay, there was manual observative testing, there is no part uh, in the process of development for that. But I would like to talk about uh, several things here uh, that, well, types of testing that don't fit a deal in the process, but we still, and for some companies or some projects, might be interesting to run. First of all, I would like to talk about testing in production. I know all the history, and when uh, yeah, people bore or are talking about testing in production, they will say, Are you crazy? What are you doing? No, no, we shouldn't do it. And if we don't establish the quality in a correct way, this is a valid uh, concern. Because you're, you're deploying to production something that wasn't tested and most probably it's broken. Especially if you use DTAP Street and with manual testing, you will fail things. But if you implement correct uh, quality um, assurance, it's not a problem. If you implement canary uh, releases, can, well, canary pattern uh, or dark la launches, you can make it work because the reality is that either people just don't see a new version of your service because it's dark launch, or only a fraction of them uh, is affected if something goes wrong. And you uh, deploy it alongside with the current version of the application and you compare the metrics, you compare the business flows. Okay, are we still making money or suddenly are we losing money? Or if generally 15 users a second subscribe to our service and so suddenly we release new version applications, it's only one, something is wrong there. So you, you, you got this powerful tool to compare. Okay, maturity of monitoring, maturity of the, these deployments is needed to, to, to go there. But companies are doing this and they're drastically uh, reducing their release cycle. Now, we, we, with the test, we are still talking about uh, minutes, so maybe hour be between you commit and deploy to production. But if you de deploy with Canary, it can be really minutes. And then you uh, <coughs> perform all the testing there. And you're performing the testing with real users doing stuff they generally do. It's not synthetic transactions, it's not the flow you thought so people will be using. <coughs> real people are testing your software in production and providing you feedback. It doesn't work for every project. For example, most probably if we're talking about banking software, uh, uh, not a good, good idea. But for, for some of the parts, maybe. Uh, but if you're Facebook, well, it's not a problem at all. If you just re have a problem and hit refresh and everything is working again now. Uh, also, we might think about security testing. And security testing, of course, needs to be part of um, every test and cycle huh, um, to do it, uh, but uh, so for some companies it's okay just to run this penetration to testing once in a while. I would strongly advise to, to do it uh, on every commit, in every cycle of the build and test release. 
if you are interested in availability, test for availability. If you're interested in resiliency, you need to test for, for resiliency. Because if this is your system, you need to, to know what will happen with your application if this service has died. Will it continue working or not? How, uh, what information will it provide to use it? Or this server dies? Or these two services dies? Or even if event bus dies? What will happen with my application? In the case, we can talk about degradation, de 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 degradation of performance, functionality, all those things, but we need to test all of these things if these are important parts. And for microservices, I believe these are important parts. And this is one of the advantages of microservices, because you can test these things and you make your application performing even if uh, huge parts of your application, uh, your services die. It's just impossible in monolithic application. So, um, I'm going already towards the end of my story. Um, what I want to mention here is that if you think of that, um, you in integration contact and to test, uh, you will see the interesting pattern. Well, we're talking about unit tests, we're uh, talking about um, how you test installation methods or objects, then we're talking about integration tests and how we um, they combine them to together and have into service flow. But then if we move on another level, on the level of a whole application, we are starting the same pattern. We're taking one unit and, and testing it in isolation, and this is contract tests. And then we go one level higher and test how these units are working together. So from some perspective, it's just uh, an approach, where are your boundaries? If your boundary is the whole application, well, you've got the, the, you can call this unit test and this integration test, and in a way they are. If your boundary is just one service, well, these are your unit tests. You can call them contracts tests, because uh, objects have contracts, it's just we don't call them contracts, but this is API, essentially. And same with integration tests. And all of these things that I was talking about, okay, I was talking uh, for them uh, from the perspective of microservices, but you, if you are developing monolithic application, uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it. Actually, you should use it, because even if uh, these are not uh, separate microservices but components in one application models, they have API, they communicate between each other. And in most cases, people just take away this, com they don't want to know this, they want to test application as a whole. But if you start uh, taking this internally, then if you decide to move to microservices, you will have an easy journey. You just take a part of the code and start uh, separately. It just won't be internal system call, it will be a call uh, with the, the goes through the networking. But the process will be the same. But if you're not doing all of this, you'll have a lot of pain uh, splitting your application into microservices, because you will need to implement all of this or your application will be constantly broken. So yeah, this was uh, how it looked from continuous delivery perspective, how we can really start uh, releasing quicker and quicker and quicker through establishing the quality. And this is done through two main ideas. We need to keep the product releasable, and we need to build in the quality into software development process. This is when I'm talking about build test release cycle. This is where the quality is built into. So yeah, key takeaways, update testing practices. You need to come into Microsoft's world with the new approaches to testing. Use immutable infrastructure, no detail, please. Use reproducible and repeatable testing all the time. Build the quality in and you know, improve continuously. <coughs> this is it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, you're describing a sort of a, a wish situation, eh? And, uh, yeah. Well, okay. But but uh, did you manage to do it like this yourself at the, the company you worked for? Uh, again, not every part of it, but mostly yes. And what's the biggest challenge to reach a reach a situation? Uh, this new way, uh, new new thinking into testing. People, most people think in the testing is again somebody else is trained to do so. Yeah. And the developer issues, so to developers management issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a shared team responsibility to be responsible for the application uh, d development, uh, testing, and delivery and operations. Yeah, yeah as well. So this is the biggest problem. And also, well, again, um, no automation. 
if you can't automatically create um, infrastructure, if you can't run the tests automatically, if you think that uh, uh, you, you can run t test manual, you just won't gain speed. Or you will gain speed, but you will lose the quality because the complication will be always broken. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you can't do automated infrastructure provision and automated testing, what you will end up is releasing all those services together. And then, what is the goal of moving to microservices? If you're losing the biggest advantage, independently releasable uh, components, then you're just releasing the same monolithic style uh, in a waterfall way. Just well, you're calling it microservices. Sounds sexy, but uh, result you're doing still uh, things yeah. the same. This is how I see it. Uh, how long do your E2E tests take? If in total they are taking hours, but you need to split them into to run into parallel chunks. Um, again, my ideal testing frameworks would uh, be de deciding uh, itself. I say I want to run testing 10 uh, flows or 15 flows, I should start them the, the same. An environment should be produced by testing frameworks. But this is not something I've seen fully implemented. I've seen it implemented in a way that, okay, the environment provision is scripted. So you run, okay, provision, this is then you connect, you, you run the, the test. Uh, and I've seen also the, the different thing, okay, we've got a number of environments. Uh, and we can run, uh, use as many of them to, to run tests in parallel. I, I haven't seen these two merged, but I don't see why it's impossible. Because again, <laughs> two, two parts are completely independent from each other. And then you always run them on the server, or you develop run it locally first? Uh, okay, so uh, the idea here and why I'm talking about reproducible and repeatable, developers can and should run these tests locally. Or they should run the, this test uh, even before they merge into master branch. Because otherwise they fail uh, the pipeline and they have to fix it anyway. So it's in their interest to find this out early in the process. And then if you're using, uh, well first of all, if, it's, if you're using Docker, if you use all, all the tools and if you automated something, you will run the same test, exactly the same locally as you will run them in the pipeline. But then the timeline becomes, you know, can affect your efficiency and but the, the, right. the, this becomes a development cycle, what you do in development. Again, you will have to do it anyway, but just you, you will well, pay the price later. Yes. Sorry, say again? If, if it breaks, you would have to do it. If it doesn't break. Make sure the, the quality and having to run it every time before you check in. Oh, sorry, then I don't understand really what, well, what I mean. If you're not certain that it will break or will break, then the question is should you run it locally or not? If you should. And wait for. I, I would say you, you should run those tests locally. Uh, okay, let's also put it like this. Most important testing, I believe, is the constructs testing. Unit, integration, and the constructs. End-to-end -end, uh, tests are created for business. They are providing feedback to business. Developers uh, should rarely run end-to-end -end tests. The, they can, but uh, they did. Uh, in the beginning, I was talking about moving tests to, to, to the left and moving tests I didn't say that. Close, it was the bottom of the pyramid. So if you see the end-to-end -end test failing, or you find the bug in manual observatory testing, you should think how I could have found out this bug using unit testing. Because then you will be uh, able to get this feedback a lot quicker. <coughs> okay. What well, I, I would like to add to that, that it, it also depends on the use case, right? Because sometimes uh, the developer is also involved in the business, and so they can write the end-to-end -end test, not necessarily around the whole suite that might take 10 hours to run, but just a specific business case that he's working on, and then it's way easier to spot a bug. And sometimes the unit test is just not enough to spot that bug or to squeeze the bug out of the corner, because the unit test is just to, well, how it says, to test the unit, mm -hmm. but it's not going to test the integration of your different units as a whole system. Absolutely true, fully agree with you here. Uh, so, uh, indeed, um, again, I was talking about multifunctional team. So, developers, if there is agreement of team, the team creates and turn tests, not the business developer should create those tests. You're changing the feature, implementing your feature, why can't you cover it with end to end tests to show business that you've created more of what you want? To me, it's absolutely a valid thing. And you're right that not every test can be uh, covered in unit tests. That's why I'm talking, try to put a uh, test as uh, left as possible, but uh, also to, to the bottom of the pyramid as possible. But if you can't cover it with unit test, cover it with integration test. 
can't cover it with integration test, cover it with contract test. But then only if you can't cover it with all these tests, then go to end-to-end -end test. And with end-to-end -end test you can cover everything. And things you can't cover, well, you, you can hire somebody specially trained to, to discover bugs in your system. But this is not, not scalable again. So, but try to put them as low as possible and as left as possible. Okay, Any thanks again. Thank you, Paul. It was really interesting.